What's up, Coachable family? Welcome back to the Coachable podcast. I'm your host, Tori Gordon, and today is a very special day because I'm in studio with none other than Dr. Sam Zan. He is the holistic psychiatrist. He's also also a professor of psychedelic medicine at UNLV, and truly, he is revolutionizing and up-leveling the standard of care in psychiatric medicine, and I couldn't be more honored to have him as someone I have personally worked with in this field. I know the level of care and consideration and groundedness that it takes to hold space for others because I've actually sat and witnessed what that's like. And also just really honored because I have partnered with Dr. Sam in certain ways that we're excited to tell you about later on in this show. So make sure you buckle up, get out a piece of paper, a pen, and this is going to be an episode you don't want to just listen to. You're going to want to really be present for and take notes because it could absolutely change your life. This man and his work have changed mine. So let's get into it. I can't wait to share more. So Dr. Sam, welcome to the show. Wow. Thank you so much for those kind words. It's exciting to have these conversations, I think, because the work that you're doing is it's so important to normalize that we all want to just focus on healing and growth and being our best self and kind of balancing ambition with being healthy, Mm -hmm. right. And not compromising our health Mm -hmm. in pursuit of our goals. And I think you do that very well. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm just excited to be here and talk about mental health. Thank you. Yeah. (laughs) And what I didn't mention, he's also the founder of something called anywhere clinic, which is a at, is that, you tell me exactly, so I don't butcher it, sure. but it's a ketamine clinic that anybody can, from the states that you guys service, um, can get care um, and psychedelic therapy, but also other uh, other ways of, of healing as well. Can you talk about a little bit what, what yeah. you do at Anywhere Clinic? Yeah, so Anywhere Clinic is our telepsychiatry platform where we can check in with a psychiatric provider or a therapist. And we might even add a little bit of coaching as well. Mm -hmm. But the key is to kind of look at our mental health from a different way. I think normally when you see a psychiatrist, it's we're in pursuit of this diagnosis, right? What are you? Are you bipolar? Are you ADHD? And we kind of reframe that process to not focus on diagnostics. We still have to, Mm -hmm. like kind of legally and for insurance purposes. But the conversation is more, let's just connect and understand holistically all of the contributing factors. Mm -hmm. And so we have just through insurance, regular normal visits, whether it's weekly, monthly. And we bring ketamine therapy and some other, I think, more cutting edge modalities into this where psychiatry has been a little archaic for a while. Yeah, that's what I wanted to start with. It's like, can you just give me the fundamental like differences between Western psychiatry and that standard of care and that approach versus what you're doing from a holistic perspective? Yeah, I think traditionally in psychiatry, if you look at the industry, it's very young. It's only 100 years old. Mm -hmm. And when it started, it was really trying to take care of the most sick of our population, people who have psychosis that need to be regulated, people who really were going through things that they, and and sadly, what we did at the time was we put them in insane asylums, Mm -hmm. right? We would tie them up. And it wasn't until 1950 that we found medication might be curative Mm -hmm. in a way. And some of the early rudimentary antipsychotics came out, but Then we said, okay, wow, there's a pill solution for this problem. And then you fast forward in the late 70s, 80s, we really popularized antidepressants. Mm -hmm. Prozac became this new happy pill, right? Just take this pill and forget about your problems. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, for many populations, it, it has benefit, right? And But then we kind of, I think we leaned in too much to this side Mm -hmm. of of trying to find solutions. And now we were left with in the last couple of decades, you go to a psychiatrist and it's just, you know, you look at a menu of medications and we're just trying to play match the treatment with the diagnosis. Yeah, We're not really looking at things holistically. We're not. So I think that's where we came from. And it's not a you know, and, uh, any kind of evil. I don't think it's like, oh, big pharma is trying to control us. Like, it's just a young evolution of a field of brain <coughs> science that's so confusing. Yeah. Right? yeah. And we're figuring it out. But there's some new tools that I think is just making it really exciting in this time. Yeah, and I want to talk about those tools in just a second. I think uh, I just want to reiterate, like, 
in my work, and I'm I'm an open book. You guys know this. I share pretty openly about my own struggles in with my mental health, how I've approached those and 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 dealt with those challenges over the years, and found alternative approaches to that. I've been on antidepressants before. Um, I've gotten off of those, but I've talked about my um, ADHD diagnosis and being on Adderall and weaning off of that, and how that affected me over the years. And so I'm really open about it and, and I'm happy to continue that, you know, in this conversation, because I think it's important for people to hear real stories and to hear, uh, to also feel like they have permission to be honest and, and just share about where they are and, and the needs that they have and see what support is there and available to them. Um, but also with my background, not just in the field of sex, social work and psychology and now in coaching, but also my personal background with the health of my family members over the years. I've spent a lot of time in hospitals. I've talked to a lot of doctors, um, um, some of my own and also the people that I care about a lot. And one of the things I found in terms of Western medicine and in our healthcare and our approach to healthcare is one that a lot of times, especially in the mental health space, is it seems to me like we're addressing symptoms um, and not always getting to the root cause of what's creating those symptoms. And something I was actually thinking about and talking about last night, if, I'm sure you've seen it, and if not, um, you would probably really enjoy it. It's called a, a documentary called Heal. Mm. And it has people like Peter Crone, who's been on the show, Marion Williamson, who's been on Fantastic the show. Doc. It's a really good documentary. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that they're talking about in that is how much our thoughts, our belief systems impact our physiology, then in uh, manifest as physical disease at times. And um, I've heard from people who've watched that show. It's like, that's a little far out there. You know what I mean? Are you saying you can just think positively and heal yourself? And I, I wasn't, and I don't think that sh- documentary is making any sweeping statements, but it is saying, let's look at what's underneath the diagnosis and the pathology, which a lot of times our doctors are just looking at where are things going wrong and how can we address that symptom, which may or may not create other symptoms that we need to then address. Um, so what does the future of psychiatry and healthcare and mental health care really look like as we raise the standard of care to address the whole person and not just put band-aids on metaphorical cuts that we're experiencing and pain. Yeah. yeah, well said. And I fully agree. I think that we are over, there's this focus, this kind of too much attention on the symptoms, mm-hmm. on this is what I'm going through right now, mm-hmm. and I need to get out of this feeling. Mm-hmm. But you look at Eastern medicine, you look at traditional practices, mental health thousands of years ago, if people were struggling, the way they got through it was through community, Mm -hmm. through love, Mm -hmm. through nature, through speaking with their elders, through having a sense of purpose and, and uh, a sense of belonging. Mm -hmm. Right. And Mm -hmm. where is that in any textbook or (laughs) training that I've had in psychiatry? Right. It's just not what we talk about. So the future, I think, which really is an exciting time right now because psychedelic medicine has now become mainstream in Mm -hmm. our industry. And it's elevating our understanding of this field. Mm -hmm. And if you look at psychiatry, my field, just break down the words, the etymology of it. Psyche means a Greek word meaning soul Mm -hmm. or mind. Mm -hmm. Iatria or iatria is healing Mm -hmm. or medical treatment. So the field that, you know, I'm really excited about seeing the future of is one that's healing the soul. Mm -hmm. Getting back to like the origin of really what we're talking about Mm -hmm. here. And not just focusing on the downstream chemical shifts yeah. that happen. Right? Heal documentary is such a fantastic one. And it speaks to the point that we are this internal pharmacy. Mm-hmm. And we can control much more than we understand even mm-hmm. scientifically how our neurochemistry is transmitted. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the really interesting intersection of like really advancing brain science, which is such a mystery, mm-hmm. with... Combining it with just an acceptance of the unknown, Mm -hmm. a little bit of a spiritual exploration of life. Yeah. And, you know, spirituality and medicine, like they don't, those are like oil and water, Mm -hmm. right? Like they're not mixed. In my training, we didn't talk a lot. Well, actually, shout out since we're in Las Vegas, um, UNLV UNLV program really taught us energy healing. Really? Which 
was Fascinating. cool. Yeah. yeah. Our, our program director, Dr. Gregory Brown, he would show us videos about people doing operations under, instead of anesthesia, hypnosis. Wow. Right. The, like the power of being in a trance like state and just not feeling our pain. Mm-hmm. And, and I think we saw like a gallbladder removal or something. Wow. <laughs> and so this concept that there's something in our energy realm, which mm-hmm. I know like you, you, you've dived into this yes. work. Yeah. We're not talking about it because we can't quantify it. Mm-hmm. Right? It's not objective data. But nothing in this field of mental health is very objective. Mm-hmm. It's it's all subjective. It's you know our realities are just our perception, our thoughts, our beliefs. Yeah. And so, getting away from the quantifying, getting away from really just I think the arrogance that like we have it all figured out. Mm-hmm. This is a science. Mm-hmm. Like no, we don't know anything mm-hmm. about mental health, wellness. What is the soul? Like yeah. how do you scientifically describe the soul? <laughs> right. Exactly. Well, and I think in you know traditional. In a traditional sense, the way I've seen that is like we've separated these things, right? So the mind was meant to be studied by psychologists, psychiatrists, and that was left to you guys, the professionals in the area of the psyche. And then the body was meant for the doctors Mm -hmm. and those looking at the physiology. And then the soul of the spirit is like that's for religion and that's that's their realm. And they didn't co-mingle and they didn't overlap. But what I found just in my own personal journey is like these things are inextricably connected (laughs) and they all influence each other. And so what I love about the, your perspective and especially in this field is that you're bringing them all together and you're saying they all have a place at the table and we're going to bring all of those things into consideration when we're looking at the best treatment for you. Right. Right. And that's what we call holistic psychiatry. Yeah. And I'm on a crusade to like make that cool, you yeah. know, make it something that you want to go check in with yourself mm-hmm. mentally, emotionally, spiritually, find your balance. Yeah. The same way it's become very trendy to, you know, take care of your physical health preventatively. Right. 30 years ago, we didn't talk about preventative medicine, mm-hmm. but now it's the norm. Right. Mm-hmm. You go and you get a checkup. You make sure your blood pressure is stable. <laughs> right? Yeah. I hope and so. we're not really doing that in mental health. We're only coming to support usually traditionally because something happened mm-hmm. right and that's great like the sports there but why not get ahead of that yeah right and and that's really i think addressing the upstream factors mm-hmm. and there's a beautiful model for this that all of medicine should be practicing it's called the biopsychosocial spiritual model okay you look at the physical and everything number one killer right now in our mental health and we're not talking about it is the foods we eat mm-hmm. i'm not talking about it enough i think you know learning about these chemicals that are neurotoxic yeah. affecting our memory or cognition or, and our mood yep you know halloween the kids eat all this candy there's studies that show that there's anxiety spikes around this time of the year right mm-hmm. and it's clear we know now that the chemicals is a cause and effect yeah um so biologically all this has to be addressed when yeah. we're talking about our mental health and then there's the psychological the traumas the the beliefs that we have about our life the false narratives that we hold that maybe were imprinted upon us at a young age and we carry forward mm-hmm. and then we look at the environmental factors. Mm-hmm. I don't think we, we touch on enough how much our home life, our work life, our um, daily interactions, you know, these things really do affect us. And then the spiritual part, yeah. the part we can't explain. Mm-hmm. You know, we all need to process mortality. Mm-hmm. Like it's, it's going to be a point in our life where if we haven't thought about it, we will. Yeah. <laughs> it's a heavy topic. Sure. We don't talk about that in Western in communities, yeah. really. In a lot of other communities, death is a part of life every day yeah. to kind of teach and, and hold on to the fragility of mm-hmm. life. Um, and, and then, you know, evolving beyond the self and saying, how do I give back to others? Mm-hmm. That's the biggest way to improve our mental and emotional well-being. Yeah. Right? It's, it's what you're called to do. And it is. It's for the purpose also of nourishing yourself. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But it did, like you, you mentioned, for so many people to get onto this path, unfortunately, and often it takes something happening or going, quote unquote, wrong. Um, sometimes we need a wake up call to wake up. Right. Mm-hmm. And it's in those moments that we come to the, quote unquote, work Um for me, it was from a selfish place in a, I need help. I, some, I can't go on living like this. I don't want to go on living like this. I want to find a more sustainable, healthy, 
peaceful way to exist in the world, to find relief from the pain or the suffering that I was experiencing. And then over time, what I realized, it, it kind of evolved. It went from I and me to we mm -hmm. to uh, to like, now how does this affect the people in my life and other my family, my friends, the people I love to like now I do this work, not just for me. I've evolved in, yes, there's still things I work on for myself, but it's now about how do I share these practices and tools that have helped bring me so much peace to the world and from a place of service? Because it's like, everyone should know this. And when I met you, um, you know, it was immediately something that piqued my curiosity because this show exists. The work that I do, this, this podcast, the coaching that I do exists because, one, I went through things that I needed support with. I needed to find a path of healing for myself. And then as I found freedom, I became the best, like the biggest advocate for what's possible. But also, and this is like my little trendy thing that I say all the time, is like I want to have, build a life and help others lead lives that feel as good as they look. Right. And so what are the components of having and uh, leading a life that feels really good and doesn't look just look good? It means creating inner alignment in the areas that you just talked about, you know, in my cells, biologically, what I'm putting in my body, the sleep that I'm getting, the nourishment that I'm giving myself, psychology, like from a psychological perspective, what are the beliefs, the stories that I'm telling myself about what I've been through and who I am and what I'm capable of. And then what do I have faith in? Do I have faith in fear or do I have faith in love and possibility? Do I have more faith in my limitation than what could be? And and so for and then environmental as well. Like what does my external world look like? that I can control my living situation, my work, is that fulfilling and satisfying, my friendships, and then my internal environment. How mm -hmm. am I curating that with intention? Um, and then the other thing is, is these alternative ways of self-healing. Um, because like many people who are probably listening to this show, there's they're rubbing up against some friction or some walls or some limitations in their life. And they're like, I'm frustrated, I'm exhausted, and what I'm doing's not working. Maybe that's they're on medication already and they're like, I just don't want a future that looks like I'm just, I'm dependent on these medications forever. It might just be there's patterns in their lives that they keep running up against and what of avoidance or self-sabotage or whatever it might be. And they're like, okay, well, I'm not getting the results I want to get. So what's an alternative? And right. when I met you and I and I learned about psychedelic therapy um, from the perspective of ketamine treatment, because I'd done work with psilocybin in the past, it piqued my interest because for two reasons. One, I'm somebody who likes to learn through experience. I won't talk about something I haven't personally experienced myself. I will never advocate for something I don't have visceral experience with and I'll never ask my clients to do something I'm unwilling to do myself. That was my first standard. The second is I'm always, I follow my curiosities and, and I guess third is I want to offer solutions and options to people who are in that place of, of feeling stuck and frustrated and give them hope. So I'd love to talk about some of these other modalities, right? Psychedelic therapy and where it, its place, where is its place in psychiatric medicine? And then get into a little bit more of the specifics around ketamine therapy as well. Yeah, <laughs> this is my jam, okay, right? Great. So let's get into <laughs> yeah. it. Um, I, I think it's really cool that we are now in a place where it's a mainstream medicine. Yeah, This is not something you only have to go and find your shaman and, you know, do your ayahuasca journey <laughs> in the jungle. Like you can now go to your doctor. And unfortunately, most psychiatrists don't really get it yet. Mm. We're still a little bit new. Mm -hmm. It got FDA approved, a form of ketamine called Spravato, got FDA approved in 2019. Mm -hmm. And so we're four years into this work. Ketamine's been used in mental health for a decade or mm -hmm. so, in pain maybe for 20 years. Yep. And so we're familiar with these medicines. And... I think what's changing now is we're changing the approach around it. And this speaks to the whole paradigm shift that I'm excited about. Instead of traditionally, you were talking to people who maybe have gone through those strategies of the past and they take their antidepressant, they take their mood stabilizer, and they're just not noticing benefit. 
In fact, they might even be noticing side effects mm -hmm. and then they come off the medicine and they think that, well, now things are worse. Mm -hmm. I was probably doing better on my medicine, but it's really just a withdrawal as your body is now reacclimating, right? These are the strategies that we've been doing for 50 years. Mm -hmm. But now, instead of take a pill every day, it's let's have an experience. Mm -hmm. Let's have a, a subconscious journey and gain insight into ourselves. Mm -hmm. Right. It's, it's like doing medication enhanced meditation, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's mm -hmm. like a deep dive into yourself. And then the science of psychedelics, what we understand, and I'm sure you know very well, and you talk about probably here is this neuroplastic change mm -hmm. that happens in the brain. This is like the one term that I think we need to popularize mm -hmm. in mental health is neuroplasticity. Mm -hmm. Because neuroplasticity alludes to the fact that as much as we used to think the brain is this fragile kind of organ and you lose a brain cell and they don't grow back. Mm -hmm. Like, no, just like everything in life, like if given the right nourishment, you can grow new brain cells, you can grow new pathways, mm -hmm. you can improve the connections in the brain. Yeah. And so neuroplasticity is what psychedelics do for us. Mm -hmm. And it allows us to see life from a much less rigid place. Yeah. And now we're just talking like this language is so different, mm -hmm. right? Instead of going to a doctor and like, here's your pill, I'll see you, take it every day, I'll see you in a month. Mm -hmm. We're actually emb embarking on this journey with somebody yeah. and guiding them towards it and really helping them reframe their subconscious thinking. Yeah. And I want to get into like, what is that experience like on ketamine and um, what somebody might be able to experience what, you know, because I know people's questions come up around that. But first I want to kind of talk about who is it for? You know, who is ketamine good for? And are, are there anybody that it might not be, you know, um, a good idea for them to, sure. to do that? Yeah. You know, there's, again, fighting the old in infrastructure of the way we approach things. When you go for medicine, especially if your insurance is going to cover it, it's got to be some kind of FDA approval. Mm -hmm. right? And initially... Spravato, the S-ketamine nasal spray, was FDA approved for treatment-resistant depression. Even the language around that, too. It's mm -hmm. like, okay, now I have treatment-resistant mm -hmm. depression, mm -hmm. and that's just the label that we've now given to somebody. So that's what it initially came out for. But what we've really advocated for and we're educating about is that this medicine exists in a generic form, mm -hmm. and you can use it as a lozenge. Traditionally, people have been using it as an IV uh, injection. In the lozenge form, you're able to, because it's not uh, paid for by insurance anyways, you don't really even have to say like, hey, this is for treatment-resistant depression. Mm -hmm. You just, the standard of care is we're focusing on mental health. Other things didn't work. Mm -hmm. Let's try this now. Mm -hmm. And so for that reason, I'd say anyone who's dealing with any kind of anxious pattern, depressive pattern, anyone who's not feeling in harmony and balance in their kind of day-to-day -day thinking mm -hmm. and... You know, that's the way we want to change the language. If somebody's been through acute grief, mm -hmm. they lost somebody, and they're having a really hard time overcoming that, the textbooks say, at the one-year mark, that's normal. After the one-year mark, it's pathology. Wow. It's just like, because we have to have an infrastructure, yeah. right? You can feel how silly our yeah. system is. Wow. <laughs> but the truth is, the earlier you can nourish yourself in a grieving process, the better. Mm -hmm. So why do I have to wait a year to treat you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you know, let's, let's do this ketamine therapy work early in the process so that when you're feeling the anger and the denial and the shock and the depression you can actually be in touch with those feelings mm -hmm. and let them move through you mm -hmm. so that you can get to the honoring and the remembering and the upward turn, a turn of that grief. Yeah. So a short answer to your question of who is ketamine therapy good for, I would say anyone who's really trying to help reprogram the way that they feel, the way they think, mm -hmm. the way they behave, mm -hmm. um, and to really adhere to the standard of care and the legalities, mm -hmm. You know, there's going to be a, maybe an anxiety diagnosis or depression diagnosis or PTSD right. that comes with that. But who shouldn't do it? Um, there's some medical complications. If somebody has, you know, very vulnerable cardiovascular health, mm -hmm. if they're at risk, their blood pressure is really high and uncontrolled. Ketamine temporarily increases someone's blood pressure, possibly 10, 20 points for about an hour or mm -hmm. so. So, you know, someone who's like prone to having a heart attack, you don't want to do this. And yeah. that's where we do a pretty thorough medical review. If someone has uncontrolled seizures or their liver is not healthy, right? These are the normal things sure. that you'd rule out. 
mentally, emotionally, if somebody actually has psychosis, mm -hmm. it's a vulnerable state that I maybe worked with one or two people who were schizophrenic and we went in a low dose and mm -hmm. we're really treating the anxious patterns and it was helpful in a way, but we would practice a lot of caution there. Mm -hmm. Someone who has a propensity towards being really manic and amped up and going four days without sleep and their brain just, the chem you know, that chemical rush happens easily mm -hmm. for them we would want to be very careful. Those are the, the rule outs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's really helpful. So you said something about the, the role of subconscious mind and how it plays a big factor in a ketamine journey or session in helping someone heal these anxious or depressive patterns. Can you talk a little bit more about the role of subconscious mind and yeah. what's happening when we, whether we have that injection or an IV or a lozenge and we take the medicine, what's, what's the science behind it? Like what's happening in yeah. the brain and body yeah. at that time? So starting with the science, which of course is very limited, right? Sure. We're still learning and discovering. There's this, system of thinking that happens in the background. We call it the subconscious. That's the kind of psychological mm -hmm. theory of, of the way that we have just programming thoughts. If you look at it neurologically, we call it the default mode network. Mm -hmm. This is kind of the circuitry that runs in the background. Yep. Somebody who I may work with a major trauma, right? let's say a, a military veteran mm -hmm. who's really seen it all. Their background thinking is I need to be safe. I need to protect those around me. I need to be constantly looking at the door, the window. That's not in their conscious mind, mm -hmm. right? They're not thinking that in the moment, yeah. but it's controlling their programming in the subconscious. And that lives in the default mode network. What ends up happening, unfortunately, is we get too carried away, right? In those examples, the proper vigilance when we're in the military is important, even hypervigilance. Mm -hmm. But when we're in normal civilian life, hypervigilance gets in our way. Mm -hmm. And so to be able to then shift that a little bit, loosen those connections in the default mode network, mm -hmm. lubricate new thought possibilities mm -hmm. to install in the subconscious, that's kind of theoretically what ketamine and other psychedelic medicines are doing for us. It dissolves away the default mode network. It nourishes the growth of new pathways, fertilizes the brain so that when we're doing the self-work, the soul searching, the therapy, we can now move from these rigid patterns. It's not this uphill battle. Mm -hmm. I have people who say, I've been in therapy for 10 years and I just don't think it's helping. Yeah. Well, one, you know, what is your therapist doing? Is it a venting session? Mm -hmm. Or are we really being pushed and challenged and shown a flashlight to some of our blind spots? And I had a patient today who said, you know, I've come off some of the, I've come off the medications, right? This mood stabilizer he's been on for a long time. And he says, I look back now and I feel less numb. This is a common thing that we, we hear. Mm -hmm. I feel less disconnected. I'm more present with myself. And it's not all great, mm -hmm. right? Like there's a shadow there yeah. that we have to approach. And I think through things like psychedelics and ketamine, we dissolve these judgmental patterns that we hold in the background. We dissolve some of the really fear-based feelings that we might have. Mm -hmm induced by trauma, induced by childhood abuse, neglect, mm -hmm. just emotional abuse, verbal abuse. These things live in our neurocircuitry. And now we're able to kind of dissolve it a little bit. And in this lubricated state, when the clay of the brain is warm, we can also manipulate and reshape mm -hmm. and move towards more empowering thoughts. Yeah. yeah. And so that's, that's the magic of this work. It is, it is really magical. And I just want to give a example or maybe like a some imagery to this and help me you know m please correct me if there's anything wrong about what I or like there's correction there for the example that I'm about to give but the way I've heard it explained before when you're talking about reprogramming the mind and how psychedelics like ketamine are able to kind of loosen those those wires and help you create new paths is like almost if you're on a mountain and you've been skiing down this mountain over and over and over again, and you know that those grooves and those like corners really, really well, and maybe doing a psychedelic is like a whole new, fresh coat of snow that yeah. gets planted, like yeah. that gets, um, you know, showered down, and now you can cre create a new path. Right. Is that and to what's add kind to that happening? analogy, sometimes that path is great, sure. and I've had people say. I don't want to do this because I don't want it to change me, mm -hmm. right? And to them, I would say, 
well, the fresh powder that is now there, it's your choice to just, you know, strengthen the divots yeah. and like yeah. use it the way you want to use it, right? You don't have to carve a whole new pathway. Mm -hmm. You can strengthen your alignment with your spirituality, with your work, with your relationships. Mm -hmm. And then some people who really can be self-aware that I'm, I'm going through it. There's a lot of negative self-talk. There's a lot of just depressive and anxious patterns. I try to get out of these kind of pathways, mm -hmm. right? This slope that I know is carrying me into a dark direction. Mm -hmm. As I try to get out, it just pulls me in more, mm -hmm. right? And we, and that's kind of the neuro rigidity that we're trying to overcome. Yeah. So it's the same way, you know, you go on a vacation. You just, life is the same when you return, but you just feel a little bit better about mm -hmm. it, right? Mm -hmm. um, the immersive retreat experience that I'm excited to talk about you're really immersing in this full day or weekend or week of changing these neural patterns. Mm -hmm. And so you come out again, lubricated with mm -hmm. that fresh powder. Yeah. So this is, yeah, it's, it's a beautiful analogy. We hear yeah. so much colorful language mm -hmm. in this space and, and that's a good one. Yeah. I mean, it just helped me to understand it a little bit better, like what's actually happening in my brain and why is it useful? Why is it something that I'd want to do? Because if I've got a, got a pattern of knowing that these types of things, you know, trigger me and then, or I speak to myself in these certain ways uh, that are, are, are kind of harmful, then it can feel like you said, consciously trying to override that f takes so much effort. Yeah. It's very, it can be very exhausting and, and just, it's unrealistic to be, to bring every thought into your, ca your conscious right. awareness. Like so much of what we have to do is on default. Yeah. And, and to your point, cognitive behavioral therapy, which, you know, works very well, sometimes it's overutilized. It's mm -hmm. become kind of our only tool in therapy mm -hmm. and that's change the way you think, change the way you behave in order to change the way you feel. Mm -hmm. But if we keep changing and changing and changing and doing that work, like you said, it drains us mm -hmm. of energy. Mm -hmm. And this is where I have like really ambitious people I work with who are like, I want all the therapy, like teach it to me. I yeah. always want to work on it. And where we have to let, uh, allow them to realize is there's this inner alignment where you almost become like a surfer. Like you do all the preparation, but you're really just riding the waves mm -hmm. at a certain point when you're aligned, mm -hmm. right? You don't have to continuously change things. It's yeah. not like all of this life keeps coming at you and you have to keep reframing it positively. Mm -hmm. It just becomes your inner narrative yeah. and your filter projects out into the world too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think in many ways, ketamine therapy, a lot of people just notice that change. I remember a quote from you, mm -hmm. you said it really just felt like I could see the other side of the coin. Yeah. I was actually just about to tell that story. So it's funny that you bring that up because I think it's useful for people to hear like what my personal experience with, with the medicine has been like, cause I've been working with you now for several months has been at this point and have done, you know, a dozen or more ketamine sessions. And, you know, I think back to my first session and our preparation for that. And I was really just open and curious and wanting to see, uh, experience what the medicine would be like and how, what, what it would bring up for me. Um, but there's a, sort of a methodology that you teach about creating a really safe space for yourself, setting some intentions, getting grounded and, tr and allow yourself to kind of, whether it's journal or write or just speak out loud, like, why am I here? Uh, what do I want from this? What do I hope? Are there questions that I'm wrestling with? Can I bring those into the awareness and just offer those up to the session? Um, and so I went through that practice. I did some grounding breath work, which you recommended, which was really helpful. And then I uh, took, partook of the medicine, which we use in what you've recommended for me. I get a prescription so I can go to my local pharmacy and pick it up. And it's a lozenge and um, let that dissolve. And, and it dissolves over about a 15 minute period and then you spit it out and basically you have you go into a sort of a meditative like state and I wear an eye mask so all of this is happening internally and I'm listening to some really beautiful therapeutic music and so I'm in a really nice calm relaxed environment and so when I went into the session um I didn't realize this then, but I was looking at my circumstances and my quote unquote problems or my stress or my relationships, whatever it might be from a certain perspective, from a certain point of view. 
And that point of view is a subtle one. Like you don't realize mm-hmm. that that's yeah. your point of view until you have a new one and then you can see right. the, from a different vantage point. It's like you're driving and you've been driving across the country and you don't realize like really how dirty yes. your window is, your exactly. windshield is until you clean it. And you're like, whoa, whoa. I can really see the world. <laughs> that's a perfect analogy. So I, uh, as I went through about, it's like a, you know, it lasted about 45 minutes to an hour. And what I realized in the midst of it is that my perspective was shifting and I was starting to orient to my life and my circumstances from what felt like a right side up positioning, like almost like I had been upside down. And all of a sudden I was able to see my life right side up. And the way I described it to you was it felt like a coin. Basically, that I was looking at everything from tails and then the ketamine session helped me to turn that over and see mm-hmm. it from heads. And, and as a byproduct of that, there was just so much relief and, and reassurance that mm-hmm. I'm okay. And the things I'm facing aren't going to overwhelm me that I can handle what's in front of me. And that actually everything is what it, I kept saying. is like, I got this overwhelming message. I'm okay. And yeah. everything is working out. And even if it's not ideal or there's things, I, areas I still want to grow in or things I might want to change or adapt, I'm okay with it mm-hmm. instead of being in resistance to it or fighting it or anything like that. And that, um, was such a beautiful shift. It gave me the clarity and it really is. It was that cleaning off the lens that I was seeing my life through. Yeah. 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 It's, it's beautiful really because it's so subtle, right? It's, it's not like you have this profound download, right? And everyone, sometimes I think that's a misnomer that we're going to go into the psychedelic journey and some life source is going to like teach us this ancient wisdom. (laughs) right? And, and maybe (laughs) it's in us, Mm -hmm. but I think the more common experience is just, feeling reset, renewed, feeling that those thoughts that a lot of people, when we talk about affirmations, they're resistant to it. Affirmations. I'm just going to say these stupid things over and over. And all of a sudden it's going to be my reality. Yes. But you've got to do it a million times, Mm -hmm. right? Because when you do it for the first 10, a hundred times, you don't believe it. But if you've heard it now a million times, maybe you actually start believing Mm -hmm. it, right? With the ketamine process, it lubricates and accelerates that process. It's like it's, those seeds, like you said, it fertilizes the brain. Mm-hmm. So it's like it's able to receive those affirmations as truth versus being like, that's not true. That's a right, lie. Right. Whereas before the statement might have been a one out of 10 in the way that we feel it. Mm-hmm. Afterwards, we're getting rid of all the baggage, all that negative self-talk, all the self-doubt, all the fear-based thoughts. Because if that's where our intention is going... We want to notice life from a love-based perspective, Mm -hmm. from a place of giving, from a place of growth. We want to recognize that there's healing in part of our journey, and that's okay, too. Mm -hmm. We really focus on that Mm self-love because then that filter really just affects everything else. And that other side of the coin that you talk about, it's just the same life stressors. Even my patient who said, I'm starting to notice things, and it's not always rainbows and butterflies. Right. Well, at least I can notice that from a place of healing, mm-hmm. from a place of growth, from a place of self-love, rather than noticing that from a place of overwhelm mm-hmm. or stress or self-judgment mm-hmm. or self-doubt. You just change the filter and the same problems will be there, but they're much more easy to interact with. Yeah. Right? One of the things that this has helped me do, because I feel like it's been a progressive medicine, like over the weeks and sessions that I've done it, it's kind of just built on itself. These new neural networks, these new belief systems, it's just gotten more integrated and more grounded. And and you and I, you know, we speak in between sessions. So I have time to like talk about what I'm experiencing and, and how it's shifting or changing the way I'm showing up in my life, like practically. And, you know, I think, one of the uh, the things that it's really helped me with is this idea of whatever I'm going through, this question of, can I be with this? Mm. Like I've asked myself, can I be with this? Can it just, 
can I not push it away or fight it or hate it or judge mm. it? It's like, can I allow it to exist right. and I can be with this and from a loving, accepting yeah. place? It doesn't mean I have to like it, right? Yeah, it doesn't yeah. mean that as I have to like love the experience or the the challenge or the adversity, but I can see it through a lens of growth and opportunity. Yeah. And this is showing me something. Yeah. And so I can brace it for that, um, if nothing else. And that's been really, really huge right. for me. Beautiful. And you know what really that is the cure for? If you looked at, can I just sit with something and be with it? That's the cure for addiction. Mm. Because addiction is the desire to escape from what we're feeling. Mm -hmm. And so you're painting the picture of the opposite. That it's not always going to feel great, but can I just be present to it? Mm -hmm. And in doing so, maybe nourish it. Maybe give it certain attention. Realize that my thoughts are actually a little bit toxic in mm -hmm. this area and I can actually change that pattern upstream. Yeah. Maybe it's my environment, right? But we're, we're being with it now mm -hmm. rather than wanting to escape from it mm -hmm. or cover it or create a facade mm -hmm. or, or band-aid it. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and that's the beautiful shift. And I think psychedelic medicine is leading and, you know, the same residency program that initially I was a little bit jaded because I'm like, what are we doing in the standard of care? Mm -hmm. I didn't understand you know, really where the healing was in many ways. We were put into the inpatient psychiatry hospitals where it's just, it's like a jail, really. Mm -hmm. um, and it really wasn't until, you know, I was rebellious. It really wasn't until we started learning more about like the spiritual elements of mental health. And now I'm teaching at that university in yeah. a way that the new students, I think, are coming out excited and not jaded. Yeah. Right. And but that's that's what we need in this kind of mental health discussion. Like absolutely. This is a positive empowering field um, and it's not something for the sick or for the ill yeah. it doesn't mean there's something wrong with you we shouldn't talk about mental illness we should be talking about mental wellness mm -hmm. right even the nomenclature because we're taught to diagnose things we're taught to ask all of the negative questions mm -hmm. You know, if anybody's ever sat with a therapist or a psychiatrist, it's depressing. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah. do you feel guilty about things? Yeah. Like, how, tell me all about your problems. Yeah. Right? And rarely are we saying, tell me about your strengths. Yeah. Tell me about your wins. Tell me about your inspirational goals. Tell me about the love you hold for yourself and others mm -hmm. and the way that you give back to the world. The questions aren't even built that way. Yeah. Which, and the, that is also such a compelling motivator for people. We use pain as a motivator most of the time where it's like, how do I escape this pain, mm -hmm. fix this pain, change this pain versus how do I get in touch with the things that give me life and also focus on that. Maybe that <laughs> would lead me towards more life, right, right. you know, and more vitality and right. more strength and more health and wellness. There's a couple more things I want to just give people access into like kind of what my experience was like. And then I want to talk about um, po the potential fears people might have around bad trips and that mm -hmm. kind of thing. So you said something about the spiritual side. And one of the other things that I experienced um, in this medicine, especially in my first session, was this, uh, the awareness of my physical body. But then, so as the medicine kind of digested in my system, I felt a... Um, a transition or like, um, it wasn't like an out of body experience, but it felt less connected to my body yeah. and felt more of my energetic spiritual presence. Mm -hmm. And the way I described this to you, and I think to, to Nikki and other people that I talked to us about, it was like the genie came out of the bottle, <laughs> right? So I experienced myself as I am this magical powerful, creative being that's spiritual, that it's expansive, it's connected to everything in the universe. And that's what happens when the genie comes out of the bottle. And I feel that it, in like expansion. And also in the sense of a genie, like I can create my, I can make my mm. wishes come true. I can create whatever I focus on and I, I ask for, and I bring intention and effort and all those things into. And so that became very visceral and real to me. And then as the medicine wore off, it was like the genie went back <laughs> into the bottle, which was my body and integrated back into that. And so I became really aware of like, the human, what it means to be human, the human condition, and then my spiritual nature. And I remember in my journal writing this down of like the two, like how I experienced them differently. And it was almost something like I had read when I, I grew up very religious. It reminded me of the Bible of like fruits of the spirit and like 
fruits of the flesh, basically. And I'm not trying to make this a religious conversation, but it reminded me of that in the sense that like my human beingness, my humanness, my humanity is the part of me that's fearful. It's the part of me that's judgmental. It's worried. It's doubtful. It's self-critical. It's all of those me clanking around as my human. And then my, my nature, my essence, who I am at my core is loving and kind and gentle and patient and connected and mm-hmm. all of those things. So some of the work you and I have been doing is talking about how do we integrate the, right. the two, right? right. Um, and how do I, how do we become less overly identified almost with our human and our ego and our personality and think this is all I am. Mm-hmm. And ketamine actually, it wasn't the first time I'd experienced that. I knew that about myself, but it gave me this re, uh, this reminder and this access to my spiritual nature that in the past felt distant or far off. Is that, you know, is that just a subjective perspective that I'm experiencing through the medicine or is there any sure. truth based, I think like based on that? Given just your life journey and the way that you have connected with spiritual thoughts in the past, mm-hmm. you're probably much more prone to tapping into that energy space. Mm-hmm. But however, for everybody, mm-hmm. we notice a little bit of this. Mm-hmm. All right, when I bring up the spiritual side of our health, some, I get two reactions. One person who's excited, they're like, yeah, I love talking about this stuff. Yeah. Or the other person's like, what? No, I thought we're not supposed to talk about religion. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like yeah. this taboo yeah. culture that we've created. And so I think there's no resistance there for you, perhaps, because of your life journey. Sure. You know, and maybe I'm making assumptions. But for most people, there's just this like, whoa, that was different. And mm-hmm. now I get to think about that there is something other than my visceral being. Mm-hmm. Right. And it's just part of the medicine is it's a dissociative drug. So it actually does pull you away from your body. Ketamine is used very similarly like hypnosis mm-hmm. for anesthesia. Yeah. Right. It pulls your thoughts away from your body your nervous system is not focused on the body if you did high high dose of ketamine under operation which you know one-year-olds do two-year-olds mm-hmm. do we give this medicine to kids because it's actually safer in many ways than opiates um then you don't feel pain right but the body feels it right it's not like an opiate that it numbs the receptor so imagine now you're going through this kind of subconscious journey and you're being present to yourself mm-hmm but you're not present to your body anymore. Mm -hmm. So then what are you present to, right? Yeah. And then it's just, you're kind of, we got the eye mask and we've got the music. So there's no sensory input that's distracting you. And then you really do discover your soul, Yeah. right? You discover your true essence, Mm -hmm. those thoughts that live in the background, this energy matter that we don't understand. Mm -hmm. You just kind of, you're in that space Mm -hmm. and you can't name it. You don't know the language. Yes. I've had that moment. I'm like, (laughs) I am inside my psyche right now. I'm exploring. (laughs) I'm exploring the psyche. And I, even to the extent something that happens in my ketamine journeys is I'll have a, like a significant or what feels like a primary thought that comes forward. Mm -hmm. And I, there's part of me that's like, I don't want to lose that thought. Right, it's it feels, fleeting sometimes. Yeah, it's like, how do yeah. I hold on to it? So what I've done is I just like say it out loud. Yeah. And I'm like, I make I mean, Such so, a common experience. Yeah. yeah. We have so many patients we see both because we do the work at home and in the office. Yeah. In the office, yeah. Well, people are just saying things out loud. Yeah. And you're really with yourself. Yeah. You know, you're talking to yourself. You're talking to your soul. You're engaging as your soul. Yeah. And that's the deeper work. And you know, people hearing me, maybe who've done ketamine, they might be like, that wasn't my experience, sure. right? There's a whole spectrum. Yeah. But that's also why the breath work is so important. Mm-hmm. That's why building those intentions and relinquishing a lot of the stressors in our life for that moment to be with ourselves is so important. And for many reasons, for, for that reason, many people don't like coming to the office. Mm-hmm. You know, we try to make it this warm, cozy place. Yeah. But just, I need a ride home, you know, and there's traffic and there's F1 going on. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> you know, so we recreated this in the home setting. Yeah. So that you can just be in your own cocoon of healing. Mm-hmm. You can create your set and setting the way you want to. Mm-hmm. And the more you build those parameters, the deeper you go into the experience. Yeah. A lot of people, I've seen other industries really jack up the dosages for people hmm. because they're like, I don't feel it. Mm. And it's that fight or flight, that resistance, yeah. not letting go mm-hmm. to drop into the experience. 
So building all those protocols before is so much more helpful because when we jack the dose up, then the side effects become much more present. And people complain of this lingering hangover, this amnesia-like effect. Whereas at a low dose, it's just kind of this pure, gentle, in and out of Mm -hmm. like a spiritual realm, right? Isn't it? Well, and I've had people ask me questions because you and I, and I want to get into this, like you and I are getting ready to host our first ever immersive ketamine retreat in Vegas, December 2nd. It's the first of its kind. It's never really been done before. Yeah, never above board. Never in a way that can be talked about. And it's not like the shady, you know, thing that might be illegal. Yeah. 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 Um, Which I wanted to talk about, but it's like... Those all of those factors and environmental factors of help uh, helping someone create that cocoon like experience to be able to drop in are all of the things we're going to be bringing to that retreat to Mm -hmm. make sure it's a really, really uh, powerful experience for people. And, you know, I think that that's essential because at like you were saying at the higher I've had people ask me, like, what is the what is the integration like after Mm -hmm. like maybe they've done psilocybin, they've done ayahuasca or they've done something else and or in DMA and it's like the next day I need a full day off, you know, in order to come back from this experience or I need a week of integration because I just had a very intense out of body experience Mm -hmm. and I'm trying to reground myself, you know. Can you speak to that in in how it relates to the ketamine experience. Yeah. 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 I'm a big fan of ketamine for that experience, for yeah. that short term experience that Same. we're talking about. Um, I advocate for all the psychedelic medicines, of course, when done legally responsibly and we're creating pathways for that, yeah. right? MDMA is going to be FDA approved. So yes. like we're getting there yeah. for PTSD. And I think it's going to be so healing for sexual trauma and for relationship trauma and yeah. things of that nature. But ketamine uniquely allows us, it's such a short half-life is what we call it. It filters out of our body really quickly. Mm -hmm. So it allows us this kind of hopscotch. Like we're just like hopping in and hopping out Mm -hmm. where to your point, you're not in this heavy hangover or this daze and you feel just kind of elated. Mm -hmm. You feel like the truer version of yourself. Mm -hmm. And so what is integration after ketamine? It's building that alignment, right? It's programming things that you want to nourish in this lubricated mind And so for us, it's going to be programming from before when we build intentions and we do our own self-journaling, going back to our own conversation through now this new filter Mm -hmm. through the other side of the coin. It's going to be creative outlets. Mm -hmm. Um, When we do this at the retreat center in Puerto Rico, there's art therapy. That's a big Mm -hmm. part of it because we want someone to really start to be in this neuroplastic state of mind and to be creative opens us up. Mm -hmm. Um, There's... I think an opportunity to have one-on-one conversations, right? So to be able to process and integrate what we experienced to add more language Mm -hmm. to what we're going through, because Mm -hmm. it is sometimes just so mercurial. We don't really get it. We're like, we felt it, but I can't articulate it. And so just talking with someone who's been in this space, who gets it, they can kind of guide you there. Mm -hmm. Um, I think for people who this is brand new to them in a retreat experience, They'll be on the lower doses end, right? We don't want to do this kind of deep dive or they'll have their first experience the week before at home yeah. to kind of graduate them up. For those who are more experienced, it can be a higher dose plunge. And really after doing the cryotherapy, the meditation, the yoga, the breath work, all of the therapeutic engagement in that state of mind, you know, you really dive into another portal mm-hmm. of just self-awareness mm-hmm. and ego actualization, Mm -hmm. you know, and these are the kind of programs that we're going to talk about to prime our subconscious Mm -hmm. for the journey. Yeah. I'm really excited for it. Yeah. So I, you know, I've said to you guys, like I've been doing this work with Dr. Sam for several, several months now. And at the root of it, it was so interesting. It was like the medicine. I, you know, this is my personal opinion and perspective. It kept showing me the importance of this work and, and my path and my future and what that looks like. And it uh, sort of as, as the medicine wipes kind of that um, windshield clean, I could see my path even more clearly. And it was just like serve the medicine, whatever that medicine is, whether it's ketamine, my breath work, my meditative practices, my somatic healing, give people and create opportunities for people to have an exp- uh, experience to encounter themselves. And, And that's what we're doing. And so the fact that we are now being able to offer this to people in a safe, regulated, 
legal environment is so exciting. So um, this episode is coming out right before we're going to be doing our first in-person retreat in Vegas. It's going to be December 2nd at a private residence here in Vegas. We're going to make it really affordable for people. We want to lower the barrier to entry. That's one of the things I most respect about you, Dr. Sam, is that this is not just for the elite. You know, this is not just for the people who have tons of money to spend on biohacking and their wellness and, you know, whatever. This We're trying to make this affordable to everybody and, and your clinic and anywhere clinic is the only ketamine clinic that is offering insurance based therapy, yeah. which is so powerful. Um, so yeah, I, I guess what, what, what can people expect if they decide they want to come to our retreat or right. a, something that we offer in the future? Cause hopefully this is going to be something Monthly. we do ongoing yeah. together. Yeah. Yeah. I think the process is first, you're just going to check in via video visit with a clinician. Yeah. And so our psychi- psychiatric providers, really warm, compassionate, helping you learn more about the process. If you have questions, if you're experienced in the space then meeting you where you are and mm-hmm. helping guide you forward from there. Uh, After that video visit, and it's, yeah, through insurance, so anybody who has health insurance, Medicaid, Medicare, private, doesn't matter. We accept broadly insurances in Nevada and in 12 other states, Mm -hmm. and you can see that on anywhereclinic.com. After that first visit, we'll do the medical review, the psychiatric review. We'll teach the safety, education, and therapeutic guidelines, and then if appropriate, prescribe the lozenge to then either be delivered to your home or picked up at your local pharmacy. And then the idea would be to start with your first session. Your clinician would schedule a session to help you build that preparation. So maybe a week later, you grow, you start at a low dose just to feel what it's like, mm-hmm. just to gain comfort. Because in the beginning, it's just to be open, to trust the process, to not feel any kind of anxious guard against mm-hmm. it. And mm-hmm. so we really want to be gentle for people who this is new for them. Mm-hmm. Again, if they're experienced, then you know they can start a little bit of a higher dose. After that first experience, then coming to the retreat becomes this next level up where you get all of the immersive set and setting to prime the body, prime the mind and prime the spirit Mm -hmm. for the experience. Mm -hmm. And you also get the love of camaraderie, the ancient medicine of coming together, Mm -hmm. you know, and I think in a time of COVID, we lost that. We're all very comfortable at home doing our video visits, our Zooms. Um, So... Having that team of health professionals, facilitators, people who just really lead with love, mm-hmm. you know, and being in that environment. Yeah. And then being able to process, integrate, and come out and continue the work at home. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so excited about it because I've been in these immersive experiences before. My journey started at a retreat like this, you know, when I experienced love and healing and connection to myself and other people in ways I'd never experienced before. And so why I'm so excited about it is because to be able to recreate this with a medicine that's just going to enhance, it's not going to, you know what I mean? All of these things are medicine in their yeah. own way. Yeah. You know, and the you don't pre- need the medicine. You don't need right? it. It's not like we're on this crusade that everybody has to yeah. try psychedelics, but you need this kind of space, yeah. right? You need to create that dynamic for yourself. We all do. We need to check in with ourselves. We need to get to know ourselves. Mm-hmm. This just happens to be a nice tool yeah. to help facilitate and accelerate the process. Yeah, it is. And I just, um, so hopeful and excited for the people that choose to say yes to this Um, because I know that when they do the work begins and like the medicine is already taking effect (laughs) that Mm -hmm. they're open Mm -hmm. to a whole new world of possibility and what their future and their relationships and their relationship to self could possibly look at look like and and that gives me so much hope and excitement for the world because I want people to know that they don't have to feel the way they feel forever. Like if they're going through hard times, if they're in depressive or anxious patterns, if they're in the darkness and the doldrums, like it can be really lonely and it can feel like this is always going to be this way. And I've just got to settle and tolerate it and endure it forever. And, and we're giving people another alternative and saying, Hey, there's, there's something else if you're open to trying it. And it's it's medically backed, right? We have clinical studies all about this work Mm -hmm. It's in five to 10 years will be the standard of care. Yeah. And it's there right now. It's just, you got to find it. Yeah. I think the last thing I want to address for any skeptics out there or anybody that's fearful, because when I get into the realm of psychedelics, you can imagine that people share their beautiful stories Mm -hmm. and their horror stories. Yeah, yeah, the bad trip. (laughs) Yeah. What, when someone says, I'm afraid of having a bad trip, Mm -hmm. What are they saying? Do they exist? And how can we make sure to try and create an environment where that doesn't happen? Really important part of 
destigmatizing this work. Uh, I think there's root causes too. One is people have maybe had their own experiences, right? They tried something when they were younger and didn't sit right and they had a scary response to it. They saw someone else go through something. I mean, I can remember at a younger age going to Coachella. I was quite straight edge. Like I was uh, drug stuff. Like I didn't grow up that way. Yeah. Um, I started drinking at 21. And, yeah, same. And so I was at Coachella and someone in the group did LSD. And later in that night, we're walking back to our tents. We hear someone screaming, mm. top of her lungs, I'm being raped. Mm. And like, how scary is that, right? Yeah. We're like, we need to find this, but like, what's going on? Yeah. And then she's just standing there by herself. Mm. Right? What was going on in her mind? What was her history? What was her path? What did the, that drug in that moment, in that environment bring up for her? Yeah. It scared me. Yeah, of course. Right? <laughs> like, I'm like, I never want to do this stuff. Yeah. And so the bad trip makes sense, right? It's like, we see it around us. Yeah. We see it in on TV and things like that. But it's usually around festivals yeah. or being pressured into something or taking something and not knowing what it was yeah, that's right? or it was mixed or we're not practicing a detoxified approach mm -hmm. in the exploration of self. We're just trying to get messed up. Yeah. Right? yeah. <laughs> and so there's a huge difference between doing this recreationally, even with intention sure. versus medically, yeah. right? Because I had so many people who've come and said, yeah, like you're in the psychedelic space. That's so cool. I went to this rave and afterwards yeah. I just felt so much better. Yeah. And it's like, great, right? Like the medicine works. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, that neuroplastic change happens and you're probably with people you loved. Yes. And you're probably really enjoying yourself. Yeah. And it just, that cemented a little bit. Environment matters. Right. Um, but the bad trip is when we didn't prepare set and setting, mm -hmm. right? And when we didn't control our environment in a way that is full of love mm -hmm. and safety and when there is uncertainty because that can come up you can do all the right things in your preparation and your mind can still take you somewhere sure we're embracing how to deal with uncertainty we've learned some breath work mm -hmm. we've learned that we have someone who can ground us that's with us mm -hmm. right this work is never done alone in my mm -hmm. opinion it's really important to have somebody in close quarters mm -hmm. just in case they can come to you and say hey Whatever you're experiencing right now, it's totally okay. And it'll be over in 20 minutes, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. <laughs> just to be grounded and comforted. Sure. And so it really brings love back into a medical protocol. Yeah. You know, and that's what's exciting. Like Prozac doesn't come with love. Mm -hmm. You know, but ketamine therapy does. Yeah, I love that you just said that because I was just sharing yesterday with my group. I run a group on Mondays called The Huddle where it's just community. It's heart-centered community coming together to talk about the things that are most important to us, the challenges and the celebratory things that we can, you know, uh, get excited about together. And one of the things I was reminded of is like, it's your love that heals, not your knowledge, mm -hmm. you know, and it gets yeah. us out of that head base, yeah. logical thinking, so mind, cognitive like, all the time, needing to know the right answers, right? get back into our feelings, our intuitions and yeah. ride that wave in a healthy direction. Yeah. And we're bringing that back to medicine yeah. and to healthcare and to the standard of care through your work. And I'm just so, so grateful because it's a breath of fresh air in what has felt like a stale kind of cold, yeah. um, somewhat shameful industry. industry. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. I, I fully believe that there's a new time now mm -hmm. and I'm just so thankful mm -hmm. that you're sharing your story, that there's so many people now with social media and using their platforms to say, like, this is normal work that we should all be doing. Yeah. Right? This is a strength. It's not a weakness. And that if they're, if we're jaded because of past experiences, there are new cutting edge, innovative approaches that are filled with things that are different. We're focusing on love and inspiration and empowerment. We're yeah. not focusing on disease, illness, and treatment. Yeah. Yeah, it's powerful. So if people want to know more about our retreat and what we're doing in the future, tell people where they can find us and we can th where they can find more about this work altogether. Yeah, absolutely. If you go to anywhereclinic.com, we'll have a big banner about the retreat right front and center so that you can just see the future dates. Mm -hmm. I hope that we make this a monthly thing yes. where it can be thematic, mm -hmm. right? And certain times of the year and the holidays, we'll focus a little bit about family because mm -hmm. it all comes up. It comes up for all of us. It right? does. Yeah. Um, the new year is about kind of renewing yourself, right? Maybe in February, you focus on intimacy and loneliness and relationships and connection. Mm -hmm. And so thematically, I'm excited for what yeah. will be the, the first phase of, yeah. I think, a really powerful program. It's just the beginning. And um, I know, and I believe in something I say a lot on the show, it's like, our best days are ahead of us. 
I really choose to believe that still, no matter where you are in your life, if you choose to have the perspective that the best days, you haven't lived your best days yet, that yeah. they're still ahead. Like, I believe that for our work. I believe that for my life, for my future. And for those listening to this show, I hope you embrace that today, that you allow this conversation to inspire you, to you know make you curious, if nothing else, that you'll maybe have your interest peaked a little bit and you'll take some time to allow this to digest and sit with you and if there's any part of your heart or your mind or your soul that's saying, hmm, maybe this there's something for me. Maybe uh, I could benefit from this. You know, I often um, say like that you have the answers within you. You have an internal pharmacy. You have an inner compass. And you can trust that voice. And the more that you allow that voice to speak to you, the more you'll start to see how it, it truly is trying to guide you towards your highest, healthiest self. And so I encourage you to to check us out. If nothing else, go to our, go to the website, anywhereclinic.com, look up the retreat and um, take those steps. It's really easy to register our first one. We're doing a discounted rate, uh, a couple hundred dollars off. You can get it for $300 for this round. Um, and you can register right online and then set up your initial appointment with a clinician from the Anywhere Clinic team so that you can make sure you get all your questions answered right then and there um, so you can prepare for the retreat, get your prescription, and then meet us on December second. So I just want to say thank you. Thank you for your wisdom. Thank you for always holding a really grounded, safe space for me personally, but also just for those that that work with you and for those that are going to come into your world and and just being an advocate and a voice for a new wave of psychiatry and and care um, that is upon us and that is giving so many of us hope. So thank you. Thank you. And likewise, being such a kind of powerful voice in this space and really helping share the work. This is something we all should get ahead of. And I love how you articulate this journey is something that's really about growth and and just being your best self, connecting with the soul. Yeah. Yeah. And I can't wait for every single one of you. If you haven't already, already remembered that you are amazing. You are loved. You are powerful. You are a creator. If you can think it with your mind, you can see it in your hand. Um, you can see it in your life. So I hope that you remember that today and that you will go check us out if this is something that uh, piques your curiosity. Until next week, you guys, go be coachable. We'll see you next week on the Coachable Podcast.